I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. As some of you have noted, um, I had a little book come out today, Making Great Relationships. And um, I kind of underestimated this book because it came out of 40, nearly 50 years, really, of working with people, 40 years of marriage. And I thought, you know, and it was just lessons, really, lessons in my own life and, and in working with a lot of couples and families and in business about the really practical skills of making relationships better. But actually, when I went back and reread it, uh, I realized, whoa, there's actually some pretty good stuff here. So you may have some interest in it, making great relationships. It's about the fundamental idea that there's a lot, usually, there's usually a lot we can do to help our relationships become better, at least for us, and often sometimes for the other people as well. And that sense of having power, in effect, or influence, or things we can do is really good as a way to counteract or counterbalance the sense of helplessness that people can often fall into. So I'll just make mention of that. And then related to this broadly, I'd like to start with a little bit of a story that helped me realize something pretty important. So I was talking with my wife the other day, <clears throat> my wife, Jan, and she has, as many people do, some um, dietary issues. She has reactions to various kinds of food those reactions are, are very real and have become very familiar to her. Uh, there's no doubt about them. And the basis for them is, is also confirmed with different kinds of medical testing. So she has various kinds of sensitivities. And it's not in her head. It's in her physiology. It's objective. And so when she goes to events, as she did recently, and I drove her to one, where people in a really friendly way uh, are serving food of various kinds. Uh, for example, she will not eat certain things, and then people will ask her about it. Or they will know in advance that certain things are problematic for her, and yet they won't realize, just because they don't have to deal with this, that certain seemingly innocent things like soy sauce usually have gluten in them, which is consequential for her, it really has an effect on her. And so they may prepare a food for her, and when she finds out what's actually in it, she'll just say with respect and gratitude, I just can't eat that. Then what happens? Now, sometimes what happens is that other people are very gracious about this, and they really get it. Other times, though, not uncommonly, what will happen is that another person will be initially a little startled and even a, a little miffed or disbelieving that actually my wife does indeed have to take this into account for her. That other person doesn't have to take that into account. They don't need to deal with that reaction in their own body to a particular food. They don't have to deal with that um, issue inside their own body, let's say, they don't have to take it into account themselves. So they just don't have to think about it. And yet my wife really does need to take it into account. And I started thinking about the things that we have to take into account ourselves that other people are unaware of. And even when they become aware of it, they may be dismissive or disbelieving or think that we're neurotic about it in some way because they don't have to take it into account. That's not their life. Turn it around the other way. Think about the situations where other people have to take something into account. They have to deal with something. They have to think about it. They have to um, cope with it. And, and you don't. And we're often really unaware of those other things that other people are dealing with, sometimes uh, seriously 
inside themselves. And we don't notice it because from the outside, you know, they're walking, they're talking, they're chewing gum at the same time. And we go, oh, but we don't realize what they're taking into account. So I want to really broaden the notion of what we uh, don't have to take into account and build on a definition I've heard from Ta-Nehisi Coates, who described privilege as not having to take something into account. I have the, I'm going to use a potentially loaded word here, the privilege. I have the fact that I don't need to worry about what I eat. I am, you know, if... <laughs> If if people can be metaphorically likened to bugs, I'm much more like a cockroach than a delicate butterfly. So it has taken me a while to appreciate that the world is full of butterflies and they have to take into account uh, what it's like for the wind to, to blow them or what it's like to be stepped on in some ways by life. I don't like being stepped on in life, but because I'm kind of like a cockroach, <laughs> you know, shake it off and keep crawling. That's sort of my theory of life, keep crawling. <laughs> right? Other people don't have that privilege. They can't keep crawling. They're not able to do that. So where does privilege come from? And how can we consider this often very loaded word with an openness now? and with a broadness, which I'm inviting you into, and ask you to really consider what are you not taking into account and should with people in your life, including people that are very close to you. Uh, perhaps at another time, we'll be able to talk about um, how to deal with others who are not taking you into account in some important way. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit, but I want to start here by really opening it up and widening our view. You know, you know a couple, three weeks ago, I, I, I did a talk related to the metta sutta in Buddhism, metta being loving kindness, the root of that word being friendliness, essentially, down to earth, really. And in the metta sutta, the Buddha's teaching and his encouragement, even his, ad, his admonition to us, is to... Um, to, to engage all beings on the basis of a fundamental goodwill, certainly not on the basis of hate and ill will and cruelty, omitting none, omitting none. So I'm talking here about expanding our field, including in very down-to-earth ways, about what we take into account. So that loaded word, privilege, <clears throat> Think of privilege in simple terms as ways that we don't have to take things into account or we have a certain standing or resources that give us access to things that maybe other people don't have access to. For example, um, you know, for multiple reasons, you know, I'm at a point in life where um, you know, I have access to the resources I need to really take care of my health needs. I don't have to take into account the uh, deductible in my insurance policy. I notice it, but I'm in a position to be able to cover it. I don't have to struggle to find a bargain in health coverage, as so many people do in America, if they can get any health insurance at all. I don't have to take those issues into account. I don't have to take into account what it's like to walk on an uneven surface at length, um, as many people do, who are you know, inflamed in their body or in a wheelchair. Uh, I don't have to take those things into account. In ways that might seem and are perhaps more charged, uh, when I'm walking down a dark street at night, I don't have to worry about being sexually assaulted. I generally don't have to worry about being assaulted at all. I'm a fairly large man and um, with a certain, you know, yeah, I don't have to take that into account. So I've thought a lot about that word privilege, which for me is a result of three kinds of things. And it's really important, I think, to deconstruct, to tease apart three sources of privilege. 
three sources of status, standing, resources, and not having to take certain things into account. And I invite you to consider this for yourself and to be aware of you know, the charge there, there might be on this. And I want to try to push through a certain guilt or a certain defensiveness on either side that can get in the way of simply seeing. So I offer this to you and see if this makes any sense to you. We land where we land in society, including in the distribution of, in my case in America, what, these days around 340 million people living in America, give or take a few. Um, we land in this distribution of people at whatever age or stage we are due to three kinds of things. The first of these is luck, for better or worse. I hit the genetic lottery in a lot of ways. A lot of people don't. And then there's the luck, the fortune, good fortune, bad fortune, that just comes your way, right? You're walking in a crosswalk, the light is green, you're doing fine, and somebody comes around a corner and clips you, whack. Or maybe you just bump into somebody randomly who then introduces you to someone who's their roommate, who then opens a door for you that changes your life for the better, forever after. Luck, fortune. There's a lot of research that shows that people tend to underestimate the role of luck in their lives. And in psychology, there's something called the fundamental attribution error, which boils down to uh, when we see good things happening, when good things happen in our own lives, on average, people tend to take credit for them. Oh, I must be really smart. Oh, I must be really virtuous. Oh, you know, I'm favored by God. Or, oh, I'm working really hard. And when bad things happen to us, on average, people tend to blame it on bad luck rather than some personal fault or error that a person made. On average, some exceptions. Goes the other way, the bias goes two ways, in which if good things happen for other people, especially people we may not like, we tend to think it was just luck. It wasn't that they earned it in some way. It was luck. And if bad things happen to other people, especially people we look down on maybe or don't like, we tend to think it was their fault. They made it happen. They made a mistake. They had sinned. They had done something in a previous life. Somehow, it was their fault. You see that fundamental bias? It doesn't mean we all do it. It doesn't mean we have to do it, but it's not uncommon in terms of how we understand luck. And one thing about luck that's scary is that it's out of our control by definition. And as we look ahead in our days and years, hopefully even decades to come, it's kind of scary sometimes to really face the reality that luck, bad and good, is a factor, a serious factor in what your life may hold in the days to come. So we tend to try to underestimate the role of luck, you know, but part of life is to live exposed. As the great Zen master Yunman taught, to live exposed to realize that we're exposed to the various winds that blow, uh, lucky and unlucky ones. And that's a matter of deep practice, to accept luck to ex and to, to choose to continue to live exposed some, to some potentially bad turns in the wheel of fortune. A second source of three major sources of where we are in life, how things have turned out for us, is what could be called virtuous effort. We worked at stuff, we tried. We had a learning curve, we took responsibility, we um, went out of our way to apply for a job, we, we tried to get into school, we tried to stay in school, uh, we cultivated important relationships, uh, we became more skillful, hopefully. We had a learning curve, you know? We took in the good, 
and we cultivated skillfulness and emotional intelligence and we, we worked to heal our wounds from childhood and adulthood. Uh, we opened up and we exposed ourselves to teaching traditions, wisdom traditions. Uh, we made efforts in that way. Uh, you know, I just read a recent paper in Science Magazine uh, that basically was about uh, the fact that uh, looking for expertise, looking for people who are expert about something, and then to the extent you can, you know, in this having to do with your own efforts, separate from luck, um, and the third factor I'll get to in a minute, uh, looking for expertise and trying to learn from expertise is a really, really useful thing, okay? Virtuous efforts of various kinds. Practice, including meditative and contemplative practice. That's the second major source of how we ended up. And, you know, I can say that I've known many, many people. I know many of you in this gathering, and I've come to come to uh, know you, and even though I haven't seen you in person, you know, I've come to know you somewhat through this. And I can see your virtuous efforts. You're showing up, right? You're showing up. You're you're being present. Uh, you know, you're 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 open to learning. You're interested in learning. That's a virtuous effort. Virtuous effort, major factor, huge factor in how things turn out, and a major factor to mobilize for yourself in the days to come. So far, so good. Probably have not ruffled any feathers yet. And now we come to the third category, advantage. And advantage is a socially constructed factor, which can interact, by the way, with luck, uh, to have the luck to be born into an advantaged situation, as I was in some ways. Uh, my parents are white, and they were advantaged in their military service during World War II because they were white compared to people who were not. And they had access to certain things, like a GI Bill, after they left uh, the service. And in my dad's case, could go to college. Um, they were advantaged uh, in my dad's case because he came from a family that um, occupied lands in North Dakota that originally belonged to the first people from whom those lands were taken. It's forms of advantage that have been passed down to me. And, um, you know, I, as a man and a heterosexual man born in 1952, I had certain advantages. Doors were easy to open for me uh, that were not so open or were in fact slammed shut for other people. My advantages, which accrued through many turns again and again and again and again, including in systems that operate kind of statistically, those advantages accumulate over a lifespan. And those structural advantages for some, occur by definition through disadvantaging others. In other words, it's not fair. The field is tilted in some ways. It, the field is tilted societally in some ways and has certainly been tilted and continues to be tilted in some ways to advantage some at the, by disadvantaging others. Now, when I look at you know, what I have in this life, including the beautiful opportunity to be with you, I know it's a result of these three factors. And I know that the factor of advantage is not zero. I'm not saying at all in my case it's 100%. I'm not going to try to you know, sort out the complexities of... Um, what amount of what I have is is the result of advantage, but I know it's not zero. I don't. It's not a hundred percent, but I know it's not zero. And how do I take that into account? What do I do about that? That's a deep matter for people to consider, right? But I think swerving away from the fact of advantage, if it applies to you, is is a deliberate form of ignorance. And as the Buddha taught, 
the deep source of suffering and harm for others and oneself is ignorance. So for me, there's a lot about practice that is big enough and courageous enough, moral enough to look at the matter of advantage, not make it everything. There's also virtuous effort. There's also just luck, fortune, um, but it's not nothing. Now, all that said, there are certain kinds of um, you know, advantage and luck and virtuous effort that result in very down-to-earth ways, in things that we don't have to take into account that other people do. And maybe they have to take them into account because they've had bad luck. Or maybe they have to take them into account because, you know, they really could have worked harder to solve that problem with their health or their situation or their livelihood. Okay. And maybe they have to take those into account in ways they've been disadvantaged. For example, I've gone with my wife. I've gone myself alone to many medical visits over the years. I never get disrespected by a medical professional. I never get patronized. I never get patted on the head and sent out the door with my issues minimized. Never happens. I never experience them evading my questions. They may not understand it initially because I didn't you know, say it in med speak initially, but I don't get any of that. On the other hand, I have been to multiple, many multiple uh, medical uh, appointments with my wife in which it's about her situation. I'm kind of sitting there quietly and I've watched her patron be patronized. I've watched her be disrespected. I've watched her um, issues be dismissed. And I've heard from many women and also many men who've had very similar experiences in the medical system from health professionals who are not being deliberately malevolent or horrible. There's just systems of advantage and disadvantage that can be factors in what other people have to take into account. All right. So what do we do about all that? And again, I really invite you to, to try to avoid the pitfalls on either side of feeling so swallowed up in, in guilt that it's hard to see clearly or so swallowed up by defensiveness that it's hard to see clearly. And I want to bring it down to everyday issues with the people in our life that they have to take into account in ways that we don't. Now, some of this may sort in ways that have to do with um, kind of widely understood sources of advantage and disadvantage, fortune and, and, and ill fortune. Um, I want to kind of talk actually more in the day-to-day, if I could, of things that are not so necessarily charged. Not because I'm trying to avoid sources of advantage and disadvantage, sources of privilege that are charged, but I kind of want to bring it down to the everyday stuff like that other people have to take into account. So here we go. Think of one thing about you that you have to take into account that maybe other people don't. I'll give you a little example. Um, I was very shy and awkward going through school, and I was young, and um, I was... I didn't know what to do, and I, I felt I was re, I was rejected, or I was mostly left out, and I didn't know how to repair it. And then that initial being left out by the time I was in third grade, because I skipped second grade essentially, uh, was uh, you know became more and more kind of ossified, more and more stuck and concretized. And so now I walk into a group setting of people that are my peers professionally, let's say. And they're interacting with each other in really friendly ways. They don't know that I still, <laughs> after 50 or more years of processing on this, I'm still vulnerable to feeling left out. I have to take that into account. They don't usually have to take that into account because they were, many of them, were the cool kids in school back in the day. And I certainly wasn't. So maybe there's something different for you that's maybe more serious that you have to take into account that other people often don't. And they may not realize 
that you have to take that into account. What's it like to be with people while having to take into account something in yourself that they generally don't have to take into account and are maybe oblivious to you having to take it into account or maybe even they're dismissive of what you have to take into account. They don't believe it. They think it's in your head or they want to problem solve it with you or they want to talk you out of it or they want you to try blue-green algae because that's the thing that will fix whatever it is that you have to take into account or some quick fix like that. What's that like for you? I don't particularly like it. <laughs> it's for me. I don't mind that I have to take into account stuff, you know, and my issues are relatively minor. Uh, they are what they are, right? It's okay. Um, I'm nearsighted if I don't have my contact lenses in. I have to take that into account. As I get a little older um, and there's background noise, it's a little harder for me to, you know, to track what's being said in a loud and busy room. Uh, I have to take that into account. I'm kind of, I'm okay with it. But to be with people who dismiss that or who kind of ugh, feel put upon, ugh, that I'm sort of asking them, hey, could you take into account this thing that I have to take into account, which is in this loud restaurant, it would really help me if you would speak up and not start mumbling toward the end of your paragraphs or sentences. Um, that's, that's irksome, isn't it, All right? Especially if you're having to take into account something that's much more serious than this, the examples I've offered from my own you know, fairly lucky um, uh, life. Turn it around. How might it be troublesome or wounding, hard for other people for you to not take into account some of the stuff they have to take into account. And how might it benefit them out of your good heartedness, like we meditated with? How might it benefit them for you to take more into account? And just kind of frame it this way, like you're taking it into account. You're not knuckling under, you're not being a doormat, you're finding realistic ways, but you're just, oh, taking it into account. What would that be like? For example, as I've used this illustration many times, driving, uh, I tend to drive rapidly <laughs> and efficiently, I think. Um, I'm not an anxious driver. I have good depth perception, right? I'm alert, I have quick reflexes still at my advanced age. Uh, I've been with people who are just not that way. They don't have the same depth perception and tracking of moving objects, they just don't. And maybe they're more anxious, maybe they've been in serious accidents. I never, I, I was in a serious accident and I walked away from it, amazingly. Um, it can be very helpful for me. And I'm giving myself some advice right now to take into account what it's like to be anxious and nervous, strapped and helpless in the passenger seat next to someone like me who is just blithely rolling on down the freeway, casually <laughs> driving with one hand on the wheel. What's that like for them? Can I take that into account, All right? Even in these really small, even small kinds of ways, All right? So I'm gonna kind of finish up pretty soon and take a look at the comments, um, you know, that have come in through the, through the chat. Uh, but I really wanna expand this notion of privilege, right? Uh, <clears throat> I wanna fully appreciate the value and the moral weight of looking at sources of privilege that have to do with advantage that's, that accrues through disadvantaging others. It's an unfair, tilted playing field. I think that's really important. But I think sometimes we can get kind of stuck around that source of privilege 
uh, and the issues around it and the charges, the charge around it, and not also recognize other forms of privilege that in some cases are earned through virtuous effort and often in many cases are just a matter of pure luck. They're ill luck, they're, they're, they're bad luck and you're good luck in comparison. And I want to invite you into examples of key people in your life. Like, let's pause here for a moment, too. Think about one or two or three people in your life, maybe people you have conflicts with or, you know, ongoing issues in the relationship. Think about one or more of these, this handful of people and ask yourself, maybe, what's something they're having to take into account that I haven't been taking into account for them. Some weight on them, perhaps a health issue, a pain in their body, maybe a loved one they're really worried about. Maybe um, they don't process information as rapidly as you do or in the same kind of ways. Maybe your mode of processing information is really advantaged in our society, like verbal, logical, analytical processing is advantaged these days, and they're more of a visual thinker or less neurotypical than you are through just the genetic lottery. And they have to take into account every day what it's like to kind of swim upstream in, in the frame of the dominant paradigm of how people process information, manipulate symbols, and engage technology. They have to take that into account every day. They're swimming upstream a little bit in the, in the majority culture in ways they wouldn't have had to in hunter-gatherer times in which our species has lived 97% of the time that humans have walked the earth. What's that like for them to have to take that into account? You could think of other examples as well. How might it serve you in your relationships to expand the field of what you take into account about what they have to take into account every day? And especially if you have the privilege, not because you did anything bad, just how it all turned out due to luck, virtuous effort, and uh, advantage, if that applies. Um, if you have the privilege of not having to take something into account, wow, it seems to me, at least for myself, and I offer this to you to consider, at least for myself, if I have the privilege of not having to take something into account, huh, if anything, that inclines me to be as helpful as I can be and to expand the field of what I'm taking into account deliberately, both out of virtue, morality, and also out of enlightened self-interest. Because if I take more into account some of the things that other people are having to take into account, my relationships are probably going to go better. There's going to be less friction, less misunderstanding, fewer issues are going to pile up. Again, this does not mean you decide for yourself what you choose to take into account that other people are taking into account. Um, and you get to decide for yourself if other people are just manufacturing their grievances that they want you to take into account. You get to decide. And because you get to decide, you get to decide what you're going to choose to take into account going forward. Think about a specific example of where this might be helpful for you to take into account something about another person. A way in often is just to inquire and to, and to try to understand them better. Like, oh, what are the, what's the underlying cause or condition that they for having to take into account that led them to do something maybe that bothered you? let you down maybe. Maybe there's information to gather. 
And as I finish, um, how might it feel for you to be a person who takes yourself into account? Because if you're not taking yourself into account, you'll get exhausted and you won't have the resources inside that would enable you to sustain taking other people into account. On that basis of taking yourself into account, how might it feel for you to feel like, yeah, I'm someone who is really interested in learning more about other people and what I might take into account that they have to take into account that I had not previously understood. How might it feel for you to be that kind of person? I suspect it might feel pretty good. So I'm gonna take a look now at what's coming through in the chat. Lots of discussion. I really appreciate your civility in the chat sidebar because um, this can be pretty charged territory. Especially, I wanna to speak to this thing. There are people who through you know, luck and other reasons often being disadvantaged in various ways, including culturally or in terms of, uh, yeah, where they've acquired the belief that they have to really take others into account and in ways that are injurious to themselves. And if you're a person who has been trained, maybe due to gender role socialization or a particular culture, that you have to always bend over backwards to take other people into account, I don't want to add to that right here. I don't want to add to that right here. I'm talking about finding a balanced place in which we take ourselves into account and we don't let ourselves be used by others. We don't let ourselves be exhausted or depleted by always taking care of others. On the basis of a kind of a healthy self-respect, healthy self-nurturance, on that basis, huh, how might it serve you? How might it be enlightened self-interest for you to expand the field of what you take into account about what others have to take into account? So I want to make that really key point. All right. Let's see here. Yes, I really appreciate, by the way, that many of the examples that have come in through the chat are all over the place. Medical issues, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, very important. Personality differences. I think that uh, in terms of conventional schooling, for example, here's another thing. Think about going back to school and who you were in school as a kid, grade school, high school, in a conventional educational setting. In my conventional educational settings, and I've worked in a lot of schools, I think there's a special place in heaven for educators and uh, people who, who work in school environments, uh, generally speaking. That said, conventional classrooms, I think as a psychologist and a child psychologist, are well suited to about a third of the kids. And I was among that third who could sit quietly and listen and write at the same time. Minute after minute, hour after hour. I was in that group, like school is fine for me. Then there's roughly a third of the kids in school, in my observation, and I think some research bears this out, who it's, they're not, that kind of conventional curriculum is not great. This is not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of cognitive style and physical and temperament. I'm calm by temperament. I could sit quietly for hours. You know, it amazes my wife sometimes. Um, you know, they're okay. They can handle it, but it's not great. And then there's roughly a third of the kids for whom, wow, they're like a jackrabbit trapped in a turtle pen. It's just, mm, it's tough for them. And there's a lot of negative feedback that comes to kids, especially in that last third group and even in that middle third. So if I'm someone who's in that first third who are well-suited to conventional schooling, I don't have to take into account that what, you know, that, it, that it's abrasive 
to my temperament and cognitive style. Meanwhile, some kid who's constantly told to sit down, sit quietly, be quiet, quit interrupting, keep, keep your hands to yourself, don't be reaching out to other people, stop touching people, da 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 da. They have to take a lot of stuff into account that I don't have to take into account. And then 30 years later, I don't have to take into account what they have to take into account when they are in similar situations today, right? A lot of um, things that people have to take into account that you may not have to take into account. Or there might be a lot that you have to take into account that other people don't. And that can be a real challenge. So I'm looking at other examples. Great. Yeah, yeah, many good examples, people being really civil. I appreciate it, very much appreciate it. Yeah, for example, um, Vicki, at 14 minutes past the hour, talked about, I think in your case, Vicki, dizziness, blood pressure swings, sensitivity to foods, they get dismissed because they, they're not that apparent. Um, and the person looks well. And also the person uh, who has to take certain things into account is often even reluctant to reveal it. That's where it can be really helpful to imagine your way into another person's life and kind of ask yourself, huh, what might be underneath it all that they're doing and why they're acting here? Maybe there's something going on besides them just you know, being mean to me <laughs> or you know, kind of acting out of line. Uh, what are they having to take into account, right? Uh, okay, great. So let's see if there's anything else here in particular. Um, very, very good, really good, taking into account. So what do you think of this topic? Broadening the field of what you take into account. The poem that ends with the line where the spirit meets the bone, All right? And, um, who, there we go. Thank you, thank you, Miller Williams. Great, thanks Christian, awesome. 29 minutes after the hour. Um, I'll read it here. Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What seems conceit, bad manners, or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. That those other folks have to take into account where their spirit meets the bone, much like you have to take into account the wars that are going on where your own spirit meets the bone. Yeah. How about we just sit with this for a minute? Let it ripple inside you. It's kind of a recognition of, of our common humanity, that much as we have to take certain things into account that may not be apparent to others, they have to take things into account. And how can we be kinder to others? about this and kinder to ourselves about what we have to take into account. Where the spirit meets the bone. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your willingness to take into account what you haven't yet taken into account. 